Hello, this is uh, Peter Kistler reporting for Heart Rhythm TV on controversies in EP. And I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Luigi DiBiase, who's head of the Arrhythmia Services at Montefiore Medical Center and the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. Welcome, Luigi. Thank you, Peter. And my pleasure to be here with you and with the Heart Rhythm TV. I thought what we'd uh, discuss today is the role of posterior wall isolation. It's become a very common adjunct uh, to uh, pulmonary vein isolation, and I was really interested in, in hearing your thoughts. Particularly, I'd be interested in your comments about where it sits in light of the STAR AF2 study, which our listeners will recall was a randomized study comparing PVI with PVI plus linear and electrogram guided ablation. Well, you know, this is a, a topic that really, you know, has my passion behind it. And uh, I, I got this passion through my mentor, Dr. Natale, that, you know, told me about this. I think, uh, you know, star AF2 trial you're mentioning. So star AF2 trial, persistent AFib, randomized to PVI only, PVI plus complex electrogram, PVI plus lines. And uh, results and comments are PVI alone is enough or it's, it's or doing more is not beneficial. So how to describe this? I think we need to go to the history. Think about, you know, Isegare described osteal isolation of the pulmonary vein. Then there is Papone describing, uh, you know, 3D mapping without circular verification of the isolation. Then Dr. Natale talked about doing AFib ablation with intracardiac echo. Well, the intracardiac echo has been key here because what was osteal in the angiograms or in the fluoroscopy was not osteal on intracardiac echo. The intracardiac echo concept has shown us that a wider area ablation, what we call antrum, was more beneficial than just an osteal isolation. So since then, we already start expanding to a wider area that encompass the posterior aspect of the left atrium between the right and the left veins. And a lot of that posterior wall is ablated in our concept of antrum. Then we just said, if the antrum is necessary, why not to extend the whole thing to the entire posterior wall since the posterior wall embryologically has the same origin on the pulmonary vein. And if we believe that the, the pulmonary vein are arrhythmogenic and we all do an empirical PV isolation, why not to do the posterior wall? And I think that is what we mean. That is why we do it. And actually I feel that, that even people against this con concept, they all realize that wider area isolation is better than osteal isolation. Right, okay. So in terms of your, um, that is a nice segue into which patients you would include posterior wall isolation in. I would say that I, we do this in every non-paroxysmal patients. We do it in all of them. And uh, the other patient that, you know, we, we think doing it are the paroxysmal patient that have comorbidities that have not, you know, a completely normal voltages in the left atrium. So I basically include the posterior wall in almost all my patients with the exception of the few patients that have really low atrial fibrillation with nothing else. Otherwise, I basically do it all the time. I suppose one of the reasons why I thought we'd start with STAR AF2 is I was interested in your thoughts about the level of evidence to support posterior wall isolation. I know yourself and Dr. Natalia have published a lot in this area. Um, do you think we're at a point where we have sufficient evidence for this to be adopted more broadly? And as an extension to that, I'm interested in your comments about high volume operators, again, like yourselves versus perhaps operators who are doing one, one AF ablation a fortnight or even less? Well, I think that, you know, I think there is enough evidence that the posterior wall increase the success rate, even in paroxysmal, 
for sure in selected persistent or persistent of short duration, as I like to call them. Our best way to recommend that is to constantly move the circular mapping catheter, avoiding doing just a box, or if you like to do the box, just don't limit the isolation to the box, but, but go inside and complete it with uh, more lesions. This, this will give you less possibility of flutter recurrence. Also, we move very quickly. We never stay long in one spot. Every 10, 12 seconds, we move from one spot to the other in the posterior wall, always monitoring the esophageal temperature. Um, Luigi, do you, do you think there's a role for a randomized study comparing PVI versus PVI plus posterior wall in, in persistent AF, or do you think we have enough evidence? I think we can randomize everything. Uh, although, of course, ideally, randomized trials should be done. But I feel that there's enough evidence there that the addition of the posterior wall increase the success rate. Now, uh, if you look at meta-analysis, some of them are positive, some of them are negative, depending the technique, how the posterior wall was performed, if really the gap, all the gap were closed or not. I think, you know, there are, meta-analysis can give you good data or bad data. Probably a good randomized trial is necessary. We are actually conducting a, a randomized control trial called the PAF trial, where we are randomizing empirically patient with persistent long standing persistent atrial fibrillation to four group. And these are PVI only, PVI plus posterior wall, PVI plus posterior wall and uh, left atal appendage isolation, and PVI plus posterior wall, left atal appendage electrical isolation, and coronary sinus isolation. I feel like sometimes in the EP community, we have to take a lesson from STAR AF2 and say, you know, for a long time, we were ablating fractionated electrograms and performing linear ablation. And it took probably 10 years before we actually did the randomized study. And I think as a result of STAR AF2, there's very little uh, targeting of CAFE. So I, I just wonder whether we, we need to take a step back and say before a, a, a procedure like this becomes widely adopted, that it needs to be supported by randomized data. But it, look, in the interest of time, um, what, what are your thoughts about a linear approach to posterior wall isolation? Did you begin with Dr. Natali with that approach and then found some challenges and found the sort of roaming circular mapping catheter or maybe a more rapid, more effective approach? I feel, I mean, I learned that way, which is, you know, moving around the circular mapping catheter around the posterior wall, trying to, you know, put it silent. And this micro scar that we create, I feel they are less arrhythmogenic and it worked very well. But, you know, I train a lot of fellows. I've trained a lot of junior attending with me. They like to use less water than what I do. And, uh, you know, an approach based on 3D mapping where, you know, you create a box and then you map again and you go inside the box and you try to, you know, eliminate all the area of uh, voltages inside the box. I think it's also a good way to do it as long as, you know, you don't do only four lines around the posterior wall. I think uh, it will work. And uh, I feel that moving the catheter quickly, uh, avoiding, uh, you know, staying too long in the same spot, monitoring the esophageal temperature probe. I think all of these are very important, you know, uh, information to keep in mind. I'm against the four lines because I feel these are more arrhythmogenic if you have one area of reconnection, you will have flutter. So I, I discourage that. Okay. And, and that's the single ring approach where obviously one gap and everything's reconnected um, as opposed to the, the antral approach and then the two lines, the roof line and the floor line. You know, that, I must say that's the approach I take myself and, you know, probably find 70, 80% of the time we can get posterior wall isolation without ablating inside the box. And I like the the sort of unequivocal nature of it, if you like. One of my concerns with the, the roaming circular mapping catheter is, I think, you know, it depends how hard you try and maybe if someone was feeling, you know, fatigued towards the end of a difficult PBI, if, if you're not very attentive with where you move your circular mapping catheter, you can easily miss electrogram. Yeah, I, I get your point. I, I don't disagree with it. I think that uh, we had to agree on the end point. And the end point has to be posterior wall isolation. Yes. And uh, I like to say, I, 
it's not important how you do it. Do you think you can get adequate contact on the posterior wall with the cryo balloon? I mean, it's not an easy thing to do. Dr. Ariane has shown nicely how to do it, but you know, you need a lot of application, a lot of effort to do that. The contact is not always optimal. You need to, you know, drag the achieved catheter very strongly. I mean, it's a proof of concept that the posterior wall improved the outcome. I think uh, we're going to have a PFA very soon. Uh, so probably with PFA, with other energy source, as long as it, they are safe, safe energy source, I think we're going to improve the way we can achieve posterior wall isolation. Okay. Um, just a couple of quick technical questions for our, uh, for our listeners. Um, do you routinely use the subdual temperature monitoring? Yes, we always do that. And it's the multi-sensor or a single sensor? You know, uh, pricing is an issue. I mean, yeah. I like uh, to use a uh, very, you know, the very small single sensor. What power are you using? I usually burn the posterior wall with uh, 40 watts and I move quickly. And are, are you going by time, like you mentioned earlier, 10 to 15 seconds, or are you going by ablation index or LSI? I have to say, I mean, I use a lot the 10 seconds because I know it's a surrogate of good in elimination, but I want to see now that I have other information. Yes, I, I use uh, uh, the ablation index. I use the, you know, uh, VC tag. I use everything like impedance drop. I use everything. Uh, and then I make a decision when it's time to move, but by 10 seconds, it's time to move all the time. Okay. All right. Well, that, we really want to thank you, Luigi. We've, we've learned a, a lot about posterior wall isolation and really appreciate your time for Heart Rhythm uh, TV and uh, wish you all the best. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much, Peter. It's been my pleasure to be here and was you know, a very nice topic to discuss. Thank you so much.